Hey, man, what you doing? Uh, trying to hack into people's personal information so I can sell it to other people! Okay. For years, people like me have been able to hack into people's internet information so we can track them, stalk them, or even sell their info to undesirables. But now that's all been ruined because these people have NordVPN! This is a side of you I didn't know about. How am I supposed to combat this kind of thing when NordVPN is easy to use, incredibly fast, has thousands of servers all over the world, and a single NordVPN account can be used on up to six devices at once? Well, not everyone cares about cybersecurity. But it's not just about security. NordVPN can also be used to get around geolocking, which means that you can find a game or video or website that isn't available in your country, use NordVPN to change your geolocation, and get full access to it. Did you know streaming services like Netflix only grant certain amounts of shows and movies to certain parts of the world? Well, you can use NordVPN to get around all that and get access to all the shows and movies that you're already paying for. Well, not everyone can afford a service like that. That's just it. It, though. All people have to do is go to nordvpn.com forward slash mythology guy and they can get a huge deal on a two-year plan plus one additional month. You are surprisingly well informed on this. And even if people are afraid they might regret this purchase, NordVPN has a 30-day risk-free money-back guarantee, meaning there's literally no reason not to do this. I guess you'll just have to stop selling people's information. Curse you, NordVPN! Andrew, get out! Here. No! You said you would review Sea of Monsters! I don't wanna! You promised! No way! If you don't come out here right now, I'm gonna replace all your Disney DVDs with the live-action remakes. Let's talk about the Sea of Monsters movie. After the cinematic equivalent of Ha Ha, You Fell For It and Now We Have Your Money, Hollywood basically said, Hey guys, we made a movie that pissed off the fans, pissed off the author, did not follow the books, did not follow the myths, was not well-reviewed, and did not set up a sequel. Let's make a sequel! Why? 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 I'll tell you why. Money. The first movie made a whole lot of it because there is no justice on this earth and frankly we should all just give up, lie down, and let the moss reclaim us. You'd think we all would have learned our lesson after how the last film went, but this movie managed to deceive us! When the trailer for this film dropped, it actually showcased several elements from the book that had not been present in the previous film, and this led us as fans to think, holy crap, they listened to us, they took our feedback, they're actually gonna try to do the books properly now, this may be worth seeing after all! But Boy, if there was ever a wolf in sheep's clothing, because, my god, this movie! While the movie does, of course, manage to get some things right, it easily gets every single important character and story element insanely wrong, and by the end, it flies so far off the rails that it manages to not only ruin the Sea of Monsters story, but literally the entire Percy Jackson story as a whole. That's no small feat, you guys. Like... I don't know whether to be angry or impressed. Gonna go with angry. I know all you lovely, sadistic people want to see me talk about this film, so let's get into it. This is Percy Jackson, The Sea of Monsters. The movie. Very important distinction. So the movie opens up with some- Oh, wait, sorry, I forgot. I'm doing a little experiment. I'm going to set a timer to see how long it takes this movie to make a stupid, factual mistake. Okay, so the movie opens up with some narration from Percy to try to get everybody up to speed. At first, I didn't believe it either. But the gods of Olympus are real. And sometimes these gods have children with humans, called half-bloods. I'm one of them. Seven years ago, four of these children were headed to Camp Half-Blood. Are you sure about that? Cause one of those kids is Grover, and pretty sure he's a satyr, not a half-blood. Wow! 28 seconds! So here we have Luke, Annabeth, Grover, and Thalia, who are all the same age in this version, even though they're not supposed to be. I really love how this movie advertised itself as more loyal to the book, and they've already made two mistakes in the literal first minute of the movie. They're trying to get to Camp Half-Blood, but Thalia sadly dies along the way. However, Zeus transforms her into a magical tree that can protect the camp forevermore, and the campers honor her by constantly mispronouncing her name. Say that! Talia's tree. Don't say Talia's tree. Talia's tree. Talia! Talia! We then cut to present day, where we're greeted by apology number one, Clarice! 
played by, I honestly thought that was Shallon Lester for a hot minute. See, in the previous movie, they basically merged Annabeth and Clarice's characters together, which made sense because the two are absolutely nothing alike and it didn't make sense. But in this movie, Clarice is her own character. Probably because they had to, considering how important she is in the second book. Oh, but don't worry, they still found a way to mess her up. See, in the books, Clarice is really buff and muscular, but we can't have that in the movie because... I have no idea. Also, in the books, Clarice puts on a tough girl act, but it's because she's trying to impress her father, Ares, by doing so. The truth is, deep down, she does care about the camp and the other campers, and when push comes to shove, she'll do whatever it takes to protect them and fight for what she cares about. It's very well showcased in the second book. In fact, this is probably the book where she gets the most character development. Absolutely none of that is showcased in the movie, and in fact, in this movie, she actually seems excited when the camp is threatened. That's so awesome. Dude, our home is in danger! My friends are probably gonna die! That's so rad! Bro, brah, brah, bad writing! Next up, we get apology number two in the form of Dionysus, played by Stanley Tucci. And, honestly... I got no complaints here. Stanley Tucci's a great choice for the role. He's got some good elements from the book. He's got some funny lines. <laughs> I think the fact that Zeus is immortal means there's no limit to how long he can hold a crutch. You know, the Christians have a guy who can do this trick in reverse. Now that's a god. Honestly, when I look at this Dionysus, I feel like the one from the books is coming to life on the screen. We also get Chiron, played by- HEY, THAT'S NOT PIERCE BROSNAN! No, this time he's played by Anthony Head, and honestly, again, good choice. Maybe an even better choice than Pierce Brosnan, to be honest. This is weird, movie. I need you to get back to stupid stuff. Don't worry, though, the movie gets right back to that, where Percy loses a match against Clarice, and Grover immediately showcases what a lousy friend he is. Besides, she has a point. Dude, what are you talking about, man? You're more than a one quest wonder. You recovered Eris' stolen chariot. No, actually, that was Clarice. Okay, what about the fall tournament? You own that sucker. Mm -mm. Clarice? Mm hmm. Okay, the Solstice Games, the Bronze Dragon's Quest. Oh, see, it's funny because it doesn't make any sense at all. Like, why does Grover think Percy did those things if he didn't? I don't get it. Percy then goes to try to talk to his father, Poseidon. Now, you may recall that in the last movie, they established that his father has the ability to communicate with Percy and his thoughts. He did it several times in the last movie, and the last movie even ended with his father promising he'd always be there for him if he wanted to talk to him. So naturally, in this movie, his father is now completely ignoring him for no established reason. Okay, well, good not talking to you again. You know, it's one thing to introduce stupid elements that weren't in the book, it's another thing to be inconsistent about it. We then get introduced to SWEET MARY MAGDALENE THAT'S A BAD EFFECT! Yeah, um, this is Tyson, he's a cyclops, and apparently he somehow just walked into the camp through the barrier. Even though monsters aren't supposed to be able to walk through the barrier. Now, they try to explain this away by saying, oh, he's a son of Poseidon, so that's how he managed to get through. But that explanation doesn't work, because most Cyclopses are children of Poseidon. In fact, it's very likely any Cyclops you encounter in Greek myth would be a child of Poseidon. And we saw in the opening two Cyclopses who weren't able to get past the barrier. So, you broke your own continuity, movie. What is this, the fifth time? And surprise, surprise, they screwed up Tyson's character in this movie. Because, frankly, it wouldn't be a Percy Jackson movie if we wrote a main character properly. You see, in the books, yeah, get used to me saying that, Percy and Tyson actually met before at their school together and became friends naturally, neither knowing the other was a son of Poseidon and Percy not even knowing Tyson was a Cyclops. And also, because Tyson is a Cyclops, even though he's a teenager, he's still very young for a Cyclops, and as a result of this, he's a bit simple-minded. This results in students at the school trying to pick on Tyson, but Percy always sticking up for him and defending him, which Tyson appreciates. Later, when disaster strikes, Tyson fights to defend Percy 
Cersei and save his life, using his Cyclops' abilities and super strength. This gives them a very lovable friendship and makes them both way more likable characters. However, in this movie, they meet at the camp, each already knowing what the other is, with no pre-established relationship of any kind. And frankly, Percy's kind of a dick to Tyson. Is he messing with me? I think he's hungry. No, not him. I meant Poseidon. Is this supposed to be some kind of joke? I mean, a half-brother, Cyclops, come on. Well, at least we have one consistency in these movies. Percy's still an asshole. In addition to that, Tyson in the books is supposed to be really buff, considering he's a Cyclops. I really don't get why this movie is so anti-muscle. Also, I don't really think it makes sense for him to put on sunglasses. His eye is still in the middle. Wouldn't that kind of make him not able to see properly? I don't know. Suddenly, the camp comes under attack by a Colchis bull, who completely shatters the barrier around the camp. Dang. And, once again, let's give credit where credit is due. I like the way the Colchis bull is designed, I think the way it moves is really cool, I like its weapons, and I'd say this is pretty darn accurate to how the myth would be. Shocker. Surprised there's only one of them, though, considering there's supposed to be two, both in the myth and in the books, but hey, I'll take what I can get. Annabeth apparently has no idea how to fight the bull, you know, daughter of the goddess of wisdom, and Clarice completely gets her ass handed to her by the bull, you know, daughter of the god of war. Did you know Clarice kills one of the bulls in the book? Yeah. Also in the books, there's a part where Tyson is fighting one of the bulls, and because he's a little simple-minded, he goes, Bad Bull. However, in the movie, he's not simple-minded, so it sounds like this. Bad Bull. Yeah, that doesn't sound right. Also, I know Cyclopses are fireproof, but are the clothes fireproof? Well, no time to explain that, because the bull now has Percy trapped and dead to rights, so obviously it's going to immediately incinerate him with its flamethrower. Or not. All right, let's see, in the books, one bull was killed by Clarice and the other was killed by Tyson, so which one of them is gonna kill this one? Percy, of course! Suddenly, Luke shows up for literally no reason other than to give Percy crucial plot information because, you know, he's an idiot. Luke, turns out you're not the only half-blood who's hard to kill. You know, prophecy. Prophecy, what are you talking about? You don't know. Huh. Well, add that to the long list of things your buddy Chiron hasn't shared with you. Also known as the long list of retcons in this movie, because we're totally building a franchise. Poison. Is she... is the tree dead? No, but dying. condition we're about to become all too familiar with. Oh, I guess the barrier's still there, even though we saw it completely shatter earlier. Who would do this? Luke poisoned the tree. Percy! Yay, you're alive. Yeah, well, I'm not the only one. Luke let the bull in. Luke did not let it in. We saw it completely shatter the barrier. What do you have against continuity? Percy wants to hear the prophecy Luke was talking about, so they send him off to apology number I don't care enough to keep track anymore, the Oracle of Delphi. Once again, pretty well done, looks good, and is voiced really well, but all that's kind of ruined when you realize that even the Oracle of Delphi does not know basic Greek mythology. Led by Kronos. A force so evil, he devoured his own children. The three of his sons escaped. Zeus, Hades, and Poseidon. For anyone who doesn't know, and that's probably just the writers of this movie, Zeus was the only one to avoid getting devoured by Kronos. He later tricked Kronos into puking up his other siblings, and they all battled the Titans together. It was not just Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades, and it did not start with Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades escaping. This is such a basic and well-known Greek story. You know, I'm starting to think the creators of these movies don't make a habit of doing proper research. The Oracle tells Percy the great prophecy of how a half-blood child of the eldest gods will decide the fate of Olympus. However, since they aged up all the characters, they've changed the age of the decision from 16 to 20 years old. Because there's totally gonna be sequels, you guys! Right? 
It's discovered that the reason the ward is failing is because Luke actually poisoned Thalia's tree. So in order to fix this, they need to retrieve the mythical Golden Fleece. So Dionysus sends out Clarice and Slipknot. I mean Redshirt. I mean Sean Bean. I mean dead by the end of the movie. I mean dead by the end of the movie. Oh, how do I know that? I will give you a thousand dollars if you can tell me his actual name without looking it up. Percy then goes off to the lake to get ignored by his dad again, and then he says this. Guess you don't have any answers either, Dad. I mean, this was your sword. No. Oh my god, no! Like, wow, you guys really didn't do any research, did you? It, it never belonged to Poseidon. Okay, you want to know where that sword came from? It, it, it's not connected to Poseidon, okay? First of all, this sword's not actually in mythology. It's something Rick Riordan came up with, which is fine. And in the Rick Riordan continuity, it was created by one of the daughters of Atlas for Heracles to use against Ladin and was then passed down through the generations until it eventually reached Percy. It has no connection to Poseidon. Poseidon never wielded it. Oh, and also, and look, I know this isn't a very well-known thing or anything, but Poseidon uses a trident! Seriously. Did you not know that? I mean, you must know that on some level because you stuck a trident on the sword in order to symbolize Poseidon. This is amazing. The fact is, it's literally staring you right in the face when you stuck it on the sword for this stupid record. This is... I, Jesus Christ. We are approaching levels of incompetence that should not be possible. This is amazing. I don't even know what else to say. Wow. 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 In the next scene, Percy and his friends sneak out and go on the quest they weren't assigned to because... Actually, I'm not really sure. I mean, the way they say it is Percy says he thinks he's supposed to go on it because he thinks it's part of his destiny in the prophecy, I guess. You know, this isn't nearly as strong a motivation as in the books. In the books, Percy sneaks out and goes on the quest because Polyphemus, the guy who has the Golden Fleece, has also captured Grover. And Grover has a very limited amount of time before Polyphemus eats him. That's a very relatable and worrisome stake for Percy to want to go on that quest and go save his best buddy. Like, honestly, it's very easy to get behind. But in this movie, the motivation for going on the quest is, Oh, I think I should. Woohoo. So they sneak past the camp guards who are wearing their finest tinfoil and plastic shields. Seriously, what the fuck? This is crazy hard to come by, and I only brought it along in case of emergency, which I guess this is an emergency, so. Here. Mist? It makes the mystical look normal. Hmm. And just know that if the camp wasn't in danger, I wouldn't be wasting this on you. Wasting what? Oh! Okay, let's talk about what's wrong with this. I swear the list of problems with this movie is getting longer than the movie's script. In the books, the mist is an always present force that basically makes it so if a mortal looked at a monster, they would see it as something regular. Like uh, a lion, like Nemean lion would probably be seen as either a regular lion or just a cat or something. Or like a harpy would probably just be seen as a bird. Or a cyclops would be seen as just a regular guy with two eyes. So it's basically what keeps this entire world from noticing the mythology going on within it and makes this entire premise work. So reducing that ever-present force to a manual spray-on product, especially one that, according to Annabeth, is crazy hard to come by, completely breaks how this entire world is supposed to function. Good writing, guys! And what's especially weird about this is there's a much later scene in the movie where we actually see the mist working the way it would in the books. Grover interacts with a guy who has several arms, and Grover, being a mythical character who's used to this, sees the guy as a mythical character. But a human looks at him and sees him as a regular-looking human, just like how the mist would work in the books. So, are we doing it as an ever-present force, or are we doing it as a manual spray-on? What are we doing? 
At the very least, though, this scene is followed up by a much better scene, where our heroes get into a taxi cab that's driven by the three Grey sisters. This scene is straight out of the book, and in my opinion, the sequence that follows is actually a whole lot of fun, and pretty loyal to the book, so I really enjoy this part. But why do the Grey sisters all have full sets of teeth? In the myth, they all share one tooth just like they do with their eye. Movie ruined. <laughs> I'm kidding, it's been ruined for a while. I think we're a little short on Drachmas. What? What do you think we're running here? A charity? Get your cheap butts out! Wow, that sequence was a lot of fun, so let's ruin it with something that's cringy and annoying and not funny. I think we're in Olympus. Hail to you, great Zeus. Forgive um, our trespass on Olympus. Hey, we're, we're seeking transport to Florida. Zeus? 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 Whoa, 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 Zeus. whoa. Stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. This isn't Olympus, okay? This is the Capitol building. We're, we're in Washington, D.C., okay? Okay? Ah. Looks like Olympus. So, are we making Tyson simple minded in this movie? Because he hasn't been simple at all up until this point. And he isn't at any point after this. What are we doing? We then get another scene that raises certain questions. Hecatonchery. Hey. And here's the questions. One, if that's a Hecatonkeries, how come it only has eight arms? Hecatonkeries are supposed to have a hundred arms and fifty faces. It's really cool and creative. So of course it's not in this movie. Second, what the hell is a Hecatonkeries doing working at a coffee shop? These things are supposed to be guarding the gates of Tartarus to prevent the Titans from escaping? That's exactly what they were doing in the books until Luke went after them and stopped them from doing that. It's a huge part of the plot. Like, what on earth is one of them doing chilling at a coffee shop? Yeah, you know, I know it's my job to prevent some of the most powerful evils in all of history from escaping out into the human world, but when I work here, free coffee. A man's gotta have his priorities. Suddenly, Grover gets kidnapped by Luke's men using a magical teleport stone that wasn't in the book. I'm sure that won't cause any plot holes. And so the gang seeks out Hermes, the great god, for help. Oh, what is that wayward boy of mine gotten himself into now? Wait. You're... Hermes! Little insulted you didn't recognize me. I mean, can you blame him? No, but in all seriousness, Nathan Fillion is a great choice to play Hermes. He's very charming, very funny, he plays the character great. Heck, they've even got a Firefly reference. Wouldn't be the worst thing in the world to have a thing or two to help you out. Collector's item, mint condition, from Hercules Bust Head, season one. Hercules Bust Heads? Best TV show ever, so of course. Canceled. He gives them a can of winds and a disintegrating tape. He also tells Percy he's been trying to reach out to Luke, but Luke won't listen to him anymore. So he asks Percy to apologize for him. He also tells them that Luke is on a yacht nearby, so they run towards the water, realizing they've just missed it, and Tyson prays to Poseidon for a way to get to the yacht. Then, Poseidon, the man who's been ignoring Percy for this entire movie for... God knows what reason, literally, immediately answers Tyson's prayer for, again, God knows what reason, literally. Sometimes you just gotta ask. All I've been doing is asking. I'm so glad this is never explained and wasn't in the book. They ride the hippocampus and board Luke's ship where they see Selena Beauregard working for him. That's Chris Rodriguez, Ethan Nakamura, and Selena Beauregard. Well, that breaks a huge plot in the fifth book. You were planning to make sequels, right? They end up getting captured by the Manticore. Even though the Manticore wasn't in the second book, it was in the third book. In the second book, it was actually Agrius and Aureus who were on the ship. They're two really cool lesser-known bear men from Greek mythology who do not get enough attention, in my opinion. Now, of course, you're probably wondering why they're not in this movie. 
So Luke has them brought down to his quarters so he can talk to them. Because he's a stupid, moronic, mustache-twirling villain, he reveals his entire sinister plan to them. He is also trying to get the Golden Fleece so he can use it to revive Kronos, the greatest enemy of the gods, and overthrow the gods with Kronos' help. We met your father. He said that he knows that he made mistakes, and he... He told us to tell you to not be so angry. Really? And he couldn't even tell me himself. The movie just said five minutes ago he's been trying to reach out to you and you won't talk to him. You could play a drinking game with all these continuity errors. Luke then has them locked in the brig. I guess Tyson's super strength can't break through those tiny little bars. So Percy uses his powers to rock the boat so they can get their backpack. They get the backpack, and Tyson gets seasick. I think I'm gonna vomit. Yup. <laughs> Funny, considering he's a son of Poseidon. Wouldn't expect that normally. Then they use the disintegrating tape to escape from the brig. Question, why don't they put that disintegrating tape on the Kronos coffin? Might as well try. Might disintegrate it. End the whole story right there. Come to think of it, why is Luke even sailing the coffin to the Golden Fleece when he could just teleport there with that teleport rock he has? Maybe you should stop adding in things that weren't in the book. Seems to be causing some issues. So they get into an action scene where they try to escape the ship. Annabeth and Tyson get onto a boat, but Tyson accidentally drops the motor into the water. And I guess Percy can't just use his powers to bring it right back up. Oh sure, he can do all that, but he can't bring the motor back up. Yeah, that, that makes sense. So Annabeth uses the can of winds to blast away, and Percy uses his powers to ride a wave away from the boat. And then Luke does the same thing. What? No, 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 no. Movie, stop it. You can't keep doing this. You can't keep doing this, movie. This is not how script writing works. This is not how storytelling works. You can't just... Make whatever random shit you want happen and expect us to be okay with it. You have to have some, some respect for common sense, some form of explanation for what's going on in your movie. You can't just keep throwing whatever the hell you want in the kitchen sink at the wall and see what lands. How is Luke doing that? He's not a son of Poseidon. He can't walk on water. He's not a son of Jesus. We know he can't fly unless he has those winged shoes. Why didn't you just give him the winged shoes and have him fly after Percy in this scene? That honestly would have been cooler. Would have showcased both their godly heritages. But no, you just... Honestly, I'm not sure what you're doing here. What are we doing, movie? What are we doing? Smart. Goddess of Wisdom's daughter, remember? Honestly, no. You've done nothing in either of these movies to remind me of that. Tyson's mist wears off and he tries to reapply it. Honestly, no idea why. You are thousands of miles from any human civilization. There is literally no reason to reapply this. And then later on, he drops the can of winds into the water because, again, I guess Percy just can't use his powers to summon it right back. There is no logic in Ba Sing Se. Suddenly, they have an encounter with Charybdis. Percy tries to use his powers, but... Percy! It's not working! The Sea of Monsters might not be in Poseidon's domain. It might not be in Poseidon's domain. Yes, it is. That is literally what kickstarts the entire plot of the Odyssey. But hey, I guess I shouldn't expect these screenwriters to have read the most famous Greek story of all time. So they get swallowed by Charybdis, and then they find Clarice on a ship filled with zombie Confederate soldiers. Shut up, it was in the book. Hey, here Charybdis. Zombies? Well, they prefer dead Confederate sailors whose lives have been given in tribute to Ares. But zombies is fine. Really? Then what the hell was up with that random disapproving look? Is that just a thing in these movies? So long story short, they come up with a plan to blast a hole in the side of Charybdis to escape through, and then this Confederate ship from the 1800s simply floats up to the top of the ocean and surfaces. Yes, science! We did it! I did it! 
Okay, there's something I need to point out in this movie. So, in the Sea of Monsters book, it really goes on to develop the relationship between Percy and Annabeth. They have some really wonderful moments in that book, like the result of Cersei's Island, and what happens when they encounter the Sirens. None of that is in this movie. And in fact, in my opinion, in this movie, Percy and Annabeth really have no chemistry. And then it gets even weirder when I realize that Percy has way more chemistry with Clarice in this film. Like, I feel like in this movie they were really trying hard to give them a friendly rivalry or a real rivalry that ends in friendship or something. You know, their rivalry was a lot more intense and less playful in the book. But in this movie, it is playful, or at least it feels playful. And because of that, it doesn't feel like two people who legitimately don't like each other. It feels like two people who are trying really hard not to admit how much they want each other. Like, honestly, everything from the way they talk to the way they look at each other sometimes indicates that there's some sexual tension going on here. Every time I see them arguing or trying to one-up one another, all I can really think is, my god, just kiss already. And as a big fan of the books, that is not a thought I want to have. But I know what you're all thinking. Wait, where's that satyr who went with Clarice on her quest? Well, according to Clarice, he's dead. Hey, where's Ignite? Oh, now you miss Ignite? Well, we ran into Scylla, that multi-headed Hydra thing. You said, I got this. Famous last words. I am shocked. Shocked, I tell you. So they finally get to Polyphemus' island, which has been merged with Cersei's island in this movie for absolutely no reason. It literally adds nothing at all. You know what else doesn't make any sense? This whole island looks like a barren wasteland, but the Golden Fleece is here. And the whole reason they're going for the Golden Fleece is because it brings life to whatever area it's in. So since the Golden Fleece is on this island, this whole island should look like a luscious paradise, shouldn't it? I really hope nobody's actually playing that continuity drinking game. I don't think it's safe at this point. So, just as I start to ponder the decisions I made in life that led me to this torturous moment, our heroes finally find Polyphemus, Grover, and the Golden Fleece. Which is not golden. I guess the name Golden Fleece wasn't a clear enough description for these people. Yes, I know it has little golden lines on it, but that's not golden fleece, that's golden stitching. Okay? It, it's wrong. WRONG! So they steal the fleece, run away through the exit, and use a boulder to block Polyphemus from exiting. If Polyphemus can't move that boulder, why would he have it outside his exit? HOW would he have it outside his exit? But it turns out Luke was waiting for them right outside, and he decides to kill Percy. Huh? You do it for me. What are you basing that on? I have no idea what you're basing that on. So then Luke, who literally just attempted to kill Percy, decides not to simply fire a second shot, and instead chooses to take Percy and his friends prisoner. Because that worked so well the last time you tried it! God, Luke is stupid! Lord Kronos, he who was betrayed by his sons. What an odd thing to say. Aren't you betraying your father? Luke puts the fleece on Kronos, but Percy and his friends escape. No, really? So Percy goes to try to get the fleece off Kronos, but he gets into a fight with Luke, and it looks like he's gonna lose when all of a sudden... Hi, brother. What? The water. It healed me. Okay, cool, but why did it wait until now to finish healing you? Did the water pause for dramatic effect? Son of Poseidon. Great! Grab the fleece. Grab the fleece. It's right next to you. Just grab it. Just grab it. Grab it. Grab it. Grab it. My god, what is wrong with you? Grab it. Grab it. Just grab it! Oh no, look what happened. If only there was some way we could have prevented this. He 
he rises. So yeah, the Golden Fleece successfully resurrects Kronos, the huge big bad of the entire Percy Jackson and the Olympians franchise is brought back and now fighting the heroes in the second movie. None of this is in the book, okay? Kronos is built up throughout the series, and yeah, Luke tries to bring him back in the second book, but he doesn't manage to. This whole sequence wasn't in the book of Luke actually getting the fleece. Kronos is not resurrected until the end of the fourth book, in order to be the villain of the fifth book, which makes sense. That's the last book in the series. That's a fine time for Kronos to be around. And he's resurrected in a completely different way. In fact, a much more dramatic and intense way, which I'm just not going to spoil here. But my god, why is he suddenly showing up in the second movie? This, it's too early. You're blowing your load like mad. What on earth are you doing? When I first saw this in theaters, I legit couldn't believe what I was seeing. And not in a good way. I remember just sitting in the theater being like, what in the hell happened? How could a movie that was advertising itself as an experience that would be so much closer to the books that they learned their lesson. Look, this movie has a whole lot of problems, but I can chalk that up to stupidity, okay? But this is another level. When you advertise yourself as being closer to the book, why would you end like this? This is as far from the book as I feel you could have possibly gotten. Like, to just, this is absolutely nothing like how it was supposed to go. Why is Chrono showing up already? It's so, so off from the story. Oh, and it gets worse. So Luke goes up to Kronos and identifies himself as the man who just saved you and resurrected you. And so, of course, Kronos picks Luke up and swallows him. Because I guess Kronos doesn't think he's going to need allies for his war against Olympus. You know, the screenwriters just went, Oh, did Kronos swallow kids before? We'll have him swallow someone now. That'll be funny. It'll be comedy gold. Because we're funny. Three surfs walk into a bar. The first surf orders a hot grog. The second surf orders a hot grog. And the third surf orders a hot grog. But he has no money and neither do the other two because they're surfs. Huh? Comedy gold. Yes, nearly. My God, this is so stupid. And wait, it gets worse. Percy then slices Kronos and there's some huge effect it has because apparently, according to Kronos... The Cursed Blade. Curse blade shall reap. I can't take it anymore! I just wanna die! We all wanna die! Percy's blade is the cursed blade? Oh, Percy's blade is the cursed blade. It's not! No! It's not the cursed blade! And it's not Poseidon's blade either, you morons! What? 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 What is this? Percy's blade is not the cursed blade. Kronos is not supposed to be here yet. Kronos is not supposed to swallow Luke. None of this is supposed to be happening. I cannot believe what they're doing here. What was the thought process going into this? What was going on in the writer's room for this movie? <coughs> yeah, you like that? You like the way I treat you? Yeah. Yeah, you like that, don't you? Yeah, your buddy liked it too, didn't he? <coughs> oh yeah, you like that because you're bad. <laughs> you like that because you're dirty. Sir! What? We need you on set! Knock on my door, knock! I'm sorry! Did you see anything? No, sir, I did not see you spinning on the source material again! Good! So then, Percy Jackson kills Kronos. Seriously, he just kills him. Our big, huge villain of the entire franchise, enemy of the gods themselves, destroyed in about two or three strikes by a guy who two minutes ago couldn't beat Luke in a fight. 
Woohoo. So apparently Luke is still alive. He falls into Polyphemus's chamber and I don't care. Oh, but wait, we're not done. Annabeth gets stabbed by the Manticore, which somehow snuck up on her despite being huge and a very obvious presence. And then they very quickly kill the Manticore and then they think Annabeth's gonna die for about five seconds. Then they put the fleece on her and she's fine. What was the point of that? Why was that scene in the movie? Why are any of these scenes in the movie? All right, well, at least we're wrapping up. So they take the fleece back to the camp, they heal Thalia's tree, and Clarice is celebrated for her victory. <laughs> movie, stop making me ship this. I should not be shipping this. Okay, you know what? I think I know what happened. Like, maybe originally they were thinking about having sequels, but somewhere through development, they just decided it wasn't worth the effort. They wanted to wrap it all up right here, and the best way to do that was to bring Kronos in right away and just kill him off with uh, making Percy's Blade the Cursed Blade to fulfill that prophecy and have a nice MacGuffin in order to do it with, you know. If you wanted to wrap up the whole series right here, I mean, it's still a dumb idea, but... At least I can get what you were trying to do, so whatever. I guess it was best to just not beat the dead horse anymore. I guess they weren't planning to have sequels. They just wanted to wrap it all up. Still not a good movie, but at least I can kind of understand the decisions they were making, even if it's not good ones. Whatever. I guess the movie's over, and thus the franchise is over. You seem happy? I'm just relieved to have that whole prophecy thing off my shoulders. I'm not altogether sure it is, Percy. Just saying, a lot can happen between now and your 20th birthday. Are we not done? Percy! 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 Annabeth was guarding a tree last night, and something happened. Wait a minute. Are we trying to have sequels? What are we doing, movie? What's your name? I'm Talia, daughter of Zeus. What are we doing, movie? Maybe it wasn't me. Maybe the Oracle meant Talia all along. Could she be our salvation? Or the cause of our destruction? How in the name of every god in the Greek pantheon were you planning to make a sequel? There's, there's literally no way. There's nowhere to go from here. The only way for Kronos to get revived is with Luke's help in this franchise. Luke would never want to help Kronos at this point. Kronos has betrayed him. He tried to eat him the second he came out. Why would Luke still work for him after that? I, mean, I know Luke is a freaking idiot in these franchise, but is he that much of an idiot? How far are you going to stretch the idiocy disbelief and even if even if Kronos got revived again there's no threat there's nothing to be afraid of Percy can just show up with that cursed blade and slice him two or three more times and he's out again why should we be afraid of Kronos why should we care there's no more build-up there's no more interest there's no more threat there's no reason to give a crap. On top of the fact that Luke would have no motivation to even bring him back. Why are you introducing Thalia and still pronouncing her name wrong? Why did you even age up the prophecy? What was the plan? What would you have done if this movie got sequels? Where would it possibly have gone? I can't imagine. I literally have no answer. Would you have done more retconning? Are you just going to rise of Skywalker every single movie after this? What what was the idea here? Where could it have possibly gone? You crazy. You people are crazy. This is unbelievable. This this is an accomplishment in cinematic history. An accomplishment of ineptitude. An accomplishment of incompetence. An accomplishment of horrible adaptation. An accomplishment of no plan whatsoever. People say the Star Wars sequel trilogy was the prime example of no plan whatsoever. I must spit on you. 
I spit on you, for you do not understand the ineptitude of the Percy Jackson movies. This is amazing. And it's truly, truly depressing. Because this is not the legacy that Percy Jackson franchise deserves. Fortunately, there will be a show, thank God. But guys, this movie broke me. I mean, it's not 100% garbage. There are little moments in it that I liked. There are characters that I liked, as I pointed out. But these are not main characters or main moments. These are little bitty bits of chocolate in just a dumpster of garbage. And those bits of chocolate do not undo the foul stench that that dumpster gives off. I really can't imagine where they could have gone from here. What they were thinking. What they were smoking when they wrote the script for this movie. The number of inconsistencies, plot holes, and just craziness that makes up this movie. The amount of thoughtlessness is to be studied and examined so that history does not repeat itself. This movie is incredible. Whereas the last movie, I can understand the choices made in the Lightning Thief movie. They're not good choices, but I know why they were made. Because they were cliches. The Lightning Thief movie replaced a lot of the good writing and original creative stuff with cliches. Because Hollywood has a tendency to fall back on what they think is still working when it isn't. This movie? I could not explain to save my life what the logic was behind the decisions made here. I will never understand it. I don't think anyone could explain it. I don't think if I sat down and talked to the director, the writer, and God himself, I could get a grasp on what the idea was for this movie. It's amazing. It's really something. I don't know what to think of it anymore. But regardless, we can put that behind us as a dark splotch on our past and rejoice at the fact that the writer Rick Riordan did write a fantastic series that is there to be read and even has multiple sequel series, spin-off series, and will soon be getting its very own Disney Plus TV show, which we can all bet money confidently will be better than this movie. It's not a high bar to meet. Our expectations are on the ground. Heck, they were on the ground before this movie came out, and Hollywood brought a shovel. The only thing left to say is thank God there wasn't a third movie, because I think that would have not only broken me, but reality itself. I need to get back to having some logic in my life. I'm the mythology guy. That was a mythology-based movie, and an incredibly, unbelievably bad one. I will see you guys next time. Bye-bye. Glad that's finally over. Ah! You took a really long time making that review. Yeah, well, it's up now, okay? Don't you think the fans deserve a reward for being so patient? Maybe they do, but guess what? There are no more Percy Jackson movies to review. Yeah, but there are other mythology movies. Well, yeah, but none of them are nearly as bad as- Oh, crap. Hey, hope you all enjoyed watching me start to lose my sanity with that freaking movie. <laughs> I'm sorry it took me so long to put that review out. Hopefully I'll get the next one out way faster. Thank you so much for your patience, and thank you so much for all your wonderful support. And now, I want to extend a big thank you to the Patreon supporters who make videos like this possible. Alex McElroy, Lilith Jade Vaughn, Sage T.Y., Gilda Ramos, Christopher D. Sampson II, Anthony Miano, Matthew Owen, Neutral Noodle, Troy Johnson, Darkling, Gavin Lothar, Toby T., Zaggard, Kane Kendrick, Krilly Dara, Dominic Fournier Bessner, Eva Frost, Habalon, Jeff Jeffington, Julian Daviau, 
Cade, Muhammad Al Dobson, NR Writing 0289, Robert Ray, Simon Wolfert, Steve King, Vivian John, Whoops, Aggie, and Mag's Story. You guys are making videos like this possible for all the people who enjoy them. Thank you so much. If you want to be a supporter and sometimes get earlier access to content like this, uh, consider supporting. The link's in the description. If you want to see the card game I'm working on, which is based on mythology, link for that is also in the description. I will see you guys next time. Thank you.